Okay, so um, awesome. So uh, this presentation is like about the like me measurement and testing challenges in PTP networks. So we'll break it basically into uh, two uh, like scenarios where one is like where you have everything in the same uh, physical space, like uh, geographical location, and uh, what are the challenges there? And the second one is like when you have geographical distribution and then again, what challenges and what options do you have? Like when you want to, let's say, uh, go with uh, such problems. So uh, uh, jumping basically directly into the problem, uh, in terms of problem formulation, we have basically PTP, which is designed for, uh, for LAN rather than WAN. And um, PTP basically mandates uh, the, these compliance switches, such as transparent clocks and boundary clocks. So often this, uh, like I'm making different arguments, like uh, different, uh, I'll say groups, like focusing on different implementations and so on. Some see this as a disadvantage and some see this as an advantage. So in my opinion, uh, if uh, your ASIC is capable to to give you these things these are advantages and uh of course if you have uh let's say and it, it's, it's very interesting also like as dotan even mentioned like as uh, we are uh going forward with these hardware uh like the, like the new generation of let's say switches and uh NICs, we are have we're getting more compatibility of these things so these things are coming basically into uh and a more widespread uh, implementation. And uh, uh, there is nothing that can uh, improve, let's say your accuracy and precision, unless you really get the right measurements at a hardware level. Um, then we have like also algorithms like uh, best master clock and so on. And again, they all usually rely on uh, the, uh, the like this time sources to be on the same network. And then on the other hand, when you wanna go, let's say with a wide area network, relying on GNSS alone um, will be like a, a relatively um, cost oriented, very cheap, I'll say uh, method to do things. However, they come with their own compromises like, uh, and usually compromises are mainly in reliability. And you have basically, now something delivered to you from the satellites, wireless, you go by antennas, you can have jamming, you can have obstruction, you can have, you name it, a lot of things can happen when you go wireless. And uh, what has been done usually in the in industry and make in all these time provider things ranging from NTP to PTP, um, we use atomic clocks. And atomic clocks are a great thing because they, uh, I, like in the presence of um, of the GNSS, you are doing your disciplining, your tuning as much as you can constantly over whatever you have, your atomic clocks. And um, the moment you lose GNSS for whatever reason or spoofing or jamming or whatever, your atomic clock ticking. It's pretty much similar to, let's say UPS for power. This is uh, an, an uninterrupted power system basically. You have this now for clock. So it basically helps you to have this uninterrupted uh, source of clock. Um, however, again, there is a need to gauge these, um, these islands, I will say, of uh, synchronization. Because again, the biggest uh, um, like hypothesis that we are taking when we go basically synchronization across data centers is are these PPS signals from all these GPS systems basically trickling down from the satellites within, let's say, what is advertised less than, I don't know, 15 nanoseconds, some say 50, some less than 100 nanoseconds and so on. So again, a little bit of a of an background, as I said, uh, PTP takes advantage of our time sampling, compliance switches, and higher rate of messages. And as I said, like basically with these uh, GNSS and uh, atomic clocks, everything, you have these islands of uh, synchronization. So to, uh, to make these tests, basically, what we thought is like, um, what we can do is we can use now 
the external timestamping feature, which uh, most modern NICs are capable to do that, which is basically you have, uh, you have the PPS output like every other NIC, but you have a, the PPS input also. So the PPS input in uh, like traditionally was uh, used by uh, some of these NIC vendors uh, to basically reset the sub second part of the PHC. Meaning you have, uh, let's say uh, your network and then you're spreading basically the TOD and then um, the TOD puts you within a second. And now the PPS from the grandmaster is disseminated via, let's say a BNC cable or whatever across the network by a tree or something to compensate also the length. Now, on let's say on the rising edge of the PPS, you have all the machines resetting like the second part and they start from zero. So this allows all the machines to go within, let's say, nanoseconds of each other. This advantage is you require to have uh, some extra cabling and you have to also keep always the length. I mean, you can use an H3 fractal method and you have to, you can basically have the length always the same because now speed of light becomes an issue like 30 centimeters for every nanosecond. And if you have a data center and let's say you're going like uh, 200, 300 meters or, and you can convert it into uh, like foot and miles. So then things uh, really become an issue. And again, you can compensate for that and so on. But overall, we're speaking of using existing infrastructure without going, let's say, uh, for extra cabling. So now in this modern NICS, this PPS input basically evolved into just taking the timestamp, a snapshot of the PHC and providing that to you uh, in a stack. And then you can basically do a lot of things with this uh, snapshot. So we're like, okay, great. What we can do with this is, uh, again, traditionally, before I uh, do a deep dive into uh, what is going on here in the, in the diagram, traditionally, in order to measure the accuracy of, let's say, your clocks, let's say your uh, NICs, your systems, the NICs in your systems across the fleet, um, you had to either use an oscilloscope. Again, you have limited, uh, let's say, options when you go with an oscilloscope because now you have to have everything like in the distance of your uh, probes. And uh, what you do is you uh, can either take one of the channels or have another external like the grandmasters, PPS output as your trigger. And now you look at all the channels. So you have basically in a graph, like all the rising edges and you see like they're dancing, let's say within nanoseconds of each other. So that tells you how like basically the accuracy of your network is. Problem with that is, uh, first of all, as I said, you have to have all the machines in the, in the same reach of your oscilloscope. Two is, um, uh, you are limited to, let's say, number of channels. Let's say most oscilloscopes, like let's say ranging uh, mid-range, let's say, they give you, um, usually they give you like four channels. And uh, let's say some of them also, they give you an additional, uh, some, I mean, you can go eight channels and so on. Uh, and they give you like the, um, the trigger. But uh, this becomes, again, challenging, more challenging. Let's say you wanna get quantitative data, most of these oscilloscopes, they will give you like a screenshot of what's going on and so on. So you, you go next level, if you wanna, you're more serious about these measurements, you can use, let's say products. Let's say for example, from Calnex. Calnex has this Paragon T. So Paragon T can uh, give you up to four channels uh, and uh, uh, reference. You can plug that to Grandmaster and then have like, let's say PPS output from these machines. And then you can look at things again limited to four channels and now the prices basically are going a little bit higher and higher. So now uh, your other option is like, you can go, let's say with some custom, uh, there are some, uh, like I've seen some uh, products that are also a crazy in price that they can give you, let's say eight channels. And I, I didn't see anything better, let's say in the marketing. And they become always challenging as you go with these more specialized equipments. Then um, the, uh, like, let's say 
with these devices with Paragon T and so on. And you're limited again to, uh, again, the re uh, reach that you have to connect now everything with a the, with the BNC cable, let's say to the same machine. So we thought like, okay, what can we do to have this uh, method, like a, me a good method to do these uh, measurements, uh, scalable, relatively cheap, I'm like, very cheap, I'll say. <laughs> and uh, like basically overcome most of these challenges. So what we did is like, we basically used now the external timestamping. We fed it basically via cesium clock to all these machines. So these machines are taking now the timestamp and they're sending it to one machine and that machine does a comparison. So in this case, basically you see like the PPS was fed to all these machines. And then um, these are the timestamps the machines are taking. If you look at uh, the basically the uh, vertical axes going through the data, you see like only the first two digits are changing. This shows that the synchronization is really doing well. And it's not like per zero because the cesium clock is, a, is independent in terms of synchronization for, with the rest of the machine. Mm -hmm. And now we sent all the, uh, like the timestamps to one machine, like in this case, you see this one here. And this machine does a comparison, basically uh, two with two itself is zero. Two with three is the two with four, two with five and two with six. And this is like basically the synchronization. So you see like everything is literally within like 10, 15 nanoseconds. So we're like, okay, great. We can expand this now going across the globe and now use the PPS pulse from the uh, GNSS basically to do external time stamping and continue doing this. So um, we learned that also in addition to validate this, if this is really working well or not, we can rely again back to the learning realizability that Yorgi earlier mentioned and uh, can take it from there to see if the packets are within things. Remember what Georgie was, was mentioning, like if you go between data centers, you have more slack because now the latency, like you have to basically, you have the uh, problem with speed of flight. So your latency uh, gives you more buffer to for the error. So we tried also this gossip algorithm, meaning every machine sends to every other machine, let's say in a rack with, let's say N machines, and every machine sends to n minus one machines its time. And then upon arrival, the packet gets compa compared with the payload, which is the time it was sent. And you have to have always this causality, meaning like packet should always uh, arrive later than it was sent. Uh, meaning like the clock gives you a notion of like a general thing. Summarizing, you can have, let's say basically these, uh, the time difference is all in a matrix. We're calling it the sync matrix. And you can do a lot of, let's say, um, uh, in like fancy calculations with this matrix, which we'll cover later on in more uh, discussions. So uh, call for action. Um, it, like this test definitely uh, can be replicated data centers and we encourage everyone else to try the same thing. And we'll be more than happy to help basically with um, uh, uh, like your implementation, your, your journey. Uh, you can utilize this accurate time sync across data centers, obviously, because all you need is disseminating basically these cables. You can just use like a T splitters, BNC, and instead of any fancy machine, literally don't need anything else. And uh, please join us on OCP tap and also visit our timing card, uh, like timingcard.com, uh, which we have basically the source code and everything for the timing card we're using for these experiments. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. We didn't gather questions this time around. We're going to take uh, 